Good morning, LA Congress. Mike's not on yet. Is it on now? No. Okay. Hello. Good morning, LA Congress. Did we have a blessed day yesterday? Amen. My name is Steve Picard, and it's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to be your MC today here in the arena. I am a member of the organizing team for Los Angeles Catholic Bible Institute. This is a program in biblical formation run by the Office of Religious Education of the Archdiocese in partnership with Loyola Marymount University. And so if anybody's looking for uh, some good biblical formation, doesn't matter what ministry you're in, uh, you can get some information on this wonderful program at the ORE booth in the exhibit hall. I have a few announcements to go over before I introduce our speaker. Uh, first of all, let me ask, just by show of hands, how many folks are here today from our local diocese, either from the Diocese of Orange or the Archdiocese of Los Angeles? Show of hands. Okay, very good. Uh, let me ask next, how many are from a Diocese of California but not LA or Orange County. So you're from San Diego or Sacramento or even San Francisco. Everybody else from California, okay. All right, next question. How many are from a diocese not in California, but in the Pacific time zone? So somebody from uh, Portland perhaps or Washington or Seattle, yeah, amen. God bless you, okay. How many from uh, a diocese in the mountain time zone? Salt Lake City, perhaps, or Denver, okay? We see you out there. All right, here's a question. How many came from east of the Mississippi, American diocese east of the Mississippi? Okay, welcome. One more question. How many people had to get on a plane or a boat and cross a big body of water? I'm thinking Atlantic or Pacific, okay? God bless you all, welcome. We are truly a religious education Congress, not only for the local church, but for God's church throughout the world. So thank you all for being here today. Yes, thank you. Let me draw your attention, if I could, to some of the rules and regulations on page seven of your program book, okay? The very first one I want to uh, draw your attention to is at the very top of that page that says, by your attendance at these events, you are granting your permission to be photographed, videotaped, so on and so forth. I need to let you know that has special meaning for all of the events here in the arena. You see our cameras in the back and around the side. Uh, you could be on camera at any time. So if you are happy, please let your face know. <laughs> and if you think that you need uh, a couple of extra minutes of shut eye, you might want to go to the very top rows, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Not only might you appear on any either of our monitors here to my right and to my left, but uh, Director Linda in the back actually has four screens that she looks at, one for each camera and one of the cameras is roaming around. So you could be, even if you're not up here, you could be on her monitor, okay? And then she has to make the decision, is that person looking happy and blessed today? <laughs> and if the answer is no, well, you're never gonna make the big screen, so. Um, just saying. Uh, you might want to check your uh, noise-making devices and turn them to silent or stun, whatever setting uh, will not cause uh, noise and grief to your neighbor. That would be much appreciated. We do need uh, ministers of Holy Communion to assist in the distribution of communion here in the arena liturgies. So if you are uh, a minister of communion at your parish, uh, would you please see uh, the folks at the table in the sacristy, which is located, I'm pointing to my right, for some of you that's going to be to your left. Uh, it's at the west entrance of the arena. That's the er entrance on that side. That's where the sacristy is. 
There are folks who are taking names for volunteers. If you are a Eucharistic minister, please consider uh, volunteering your time here uh, for the arena liturgies. And now with your kind permission, I would like to uh, lead us in a prayer uh, to begin our session today. So let us be aware and attentive that we are in the presence of God. We always are. Let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O oh God, you are kind and merciful. You never let any of your children out of your sight, even though we may seek to run away from you. You call us home and are ever ready to forgive us. Give us a heart that is always open to your grace, that your mercy may overflow in us. Give us hearts of courage that we may never shy away from what justice demands. May Jesus, your son, our brother and our good shepherd, lead us, to, lead us all to your kingdom where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. My friends, you are in workshop 4-1, speaking prophetically for justice, principles for Christian prophecy, and our wonderful speaker, Father Ronald Rollheiser. Father Ronald Rollheiser is a Roman Catholic priest and member of the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate. He is president of the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas. He has his PhD in sacred uh, theology doctorate from the University of Levin in Belgium. He is a community builder, a lecturer, and a writer. His books are popular throughout the English-speaking world and have been translated into many languages. I would like to draw your attention to his most recent publication, Bruised and Wounded, Struggling to Understand Suicide, uh, Paraclete Press. In fact, all of Father's books are available at the Paraclete Press booth. His weekly column is carried by more than 80 publications worldwide. He was carried for a long time by the Tidings and continues to be carried by the successor publication, The Angelus, which you can get in either print media or electronically. Prior to his present position, Father Rollheiser taught theology and philosophy at Newman Theological College in Edmonton, Alberta. Yeah, we have a couple of folks from Canada. Welcome. He's also served as the provincial superior of his Oblate province and on the general council for the Oblates in Rome. Please join me in extending a very warm Religious Education Congress welcome back to Father Ronald Rollheiser. Good morning, everyone. How's the sound? Everyone can hear? Well, I want to thank the introducer for this, this wonderful introduction, but he forgot one thing when he was talking about who came from here and who came from there. He didn't say who came here from Canada. Okay. That's an oversight. He won't get paid. Okay. Just to test the microphones and the sound, I want to tell you two kind of irreverent stories that shouldn't be told in a Catholic uh, context, but uh, kind of lighten the thing for a heavy topic. I have a friend, he's, he, comes, he was born and raised in the Philippines, and he tells this story. He said he grew up in the Philippines. He said, our family was quite poor. He said, and I always wanted a bicycle, but my family couldn't afford one. He said, so I began to pray to God to give me a bicycle. 
And everybody laughed at me. They said, that's not the way God works. You don't just pray for a bicycle. God gives you a bicycle. He said, that's not how God works. He said, so I stole the bicycle and went to confession. He said, he said, because that's the way God works. Okay. <laughs> Similar kind of a story was an older a grandfather. He was talking to his grandchildren. He says, you know, he says, I can't understand where the world's going. Everything's changing. It's not like it was in the old days. He said, you know, when I was a kid, he said, I could go to the corner store, and I'd have a dollar in my pocket, and I would come back with a large Coke, a bag of chips, two candy bars, and three packs of gum. He said, today you can't do this anymore. He said, they have cameras everywhere. Thanks for laughing. I wasn't sure where those two jokes were going to go. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we have a wonderful topic. Speaking prophetically for justice, um, thirsting for justice. And my take this morning, I want to give some principles for prophecy. How do we, how do we become prophetic people for justice? And then what are the rules for this? So I want to give you what I call 10 commandments for speaking justice. Okay. The first one is this, and it's actually a quote from Daniel Berrigan, who I think was one of the, the, the people who modeled this for us, one of the social justice prophets of our time. And this is a very important line. It maybe capsulizes all the others. To be a prophet means to make a vow of love and not of alienation. I think you get what's being said there. A prophet makes a vow of love and not of alienation. So that immediately draws a distinction between somebody who stirs up trouble and somebody who offers prophecy out of love. I remember going to a church conference some years ago, and we were all asked, I wasn't all of us that comfortable with that, for everybody to go to the microphone and say, what gift do I think I bring to the church? So it was a little, uh, you need a little ego to do that well. <laughs> So the question is, what gift do I bring to the church? I think I bring to the church. Well, one of the men who went up, who was really known to be a disturber in every kind of way, um, not always for the right things, but he said, I define myself as a prophet. He said, I'm an agitator. I just get into people's faces for the gospel. He said, I'm a prophet. And I think about 90% of the people there thought, you're an agitator, you are not a prophet. See, a prophet speaks out of love. An agitator gets in people's faces. And oftentimes, uh, when we're agitating, like the second line, there's the distinction between operating out of egoism and speaking out of faith and hope. It's easy to be angry. It's easy even to kind of want to speak prophetically. But a lot of times what we're doing is we're just getting even with the world. We're not speaking for the poor. We're speaking out of our own woundedness. Um, that's not prophecy. So a prophet risks misunderstanding, but never seeks it. We, we, if, if you want to speak prophetically, you're going to risk being misunderstood, but you never seek that. And you see that, first of all, in Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't come here to upset people, and the, and the central part of all of Jesus' message is a message of love. Jesus preached love, if you preach love with all its implications, eventually it's going to get you into trouble. But you don't want to get into trouble. You want to preach love. You're seeking to melt hearts, to convert hearts, <clears throat> not to break hearts or in, to embitter hearts. I'll give you some examples. <clears throat> and I hope you don't mind my using Daniel Berrigan quite often as an example. He, he wrote a book some years ago called Ten Commandments for the Long Haul, which in some ways is one of the best books on kind of practical principles for prophecy you can read. But you know, when Berrigan used to do acts of nonviolence, so he would break into nuclear places, and you know, their last act, they actually stripped the metal off a nuclear cone and turned it into a plowshare, you know, turn your swords into plowshares, but they would always do this. The day before him and the people who did this, usually his brother and some sisters and so on. One of our oblates, who I'll talk about, Larry Rosebaugh, and Larry shared these stories with me, he says, we'd, we'd have a day of retreat, 
He said, then we'd spend the entire night in prayer. He said, then we'd say Mass. And as we finished Mass, we'd walk over to do this act. And Berger would always say, if you can't do this without being angry at the people who are arresting you, don't do it. If you can't do this without being angry at the people you're opposing, don't do it. He said, it's not prophecy. A prophet loves the people. Remember, Jesus, even as he's dying, he's praying and loving those who are killing him. Um, that's prophecy. The prophet makes a vow of love and not of alienation. And that's a, that's a distinction that often you don't see. Okay. And so a prophet is single-minded, and that can be misunderstood, but a prophet always operates out of a mellow heart. You know, I first heard this from Gustavo Gutierrez himself. And I was a young student, and it actually surprised me. But Gustavo Gutierrez, who's the father of liberation theology, he said to, uh, and he was talking to a Western audience, an American audience, and he said, you know something? He said, if you're watching your, the news at night, and you see the injustice in the world, and you grow angry, you say, this isn't right. I'm going to go and help these people. He said, don't come. Don't come. He said, the poor have many problems without importing your anger and neuroses. He said, they're already unhappy, or they have already problems. They don't need your unhappiness. He said, if you can watch the news, or you can look at your life, and you can be grateful for what God has done for you, then come and live with us, because you'll come as a loving force, not as a force of anger. When I was a young student in Belgium, way back in the early 80s, I went one year at Christmas time with a couple of Canadian friends who were studying philosophy, and we went to spend Christmas and the Christmas break with Sister Emmanuel of Cairo. Sister Emmanuel was a sister of Zion, um, and uh, she was a retired teacher, but she spent the last 20 years of her life in Cairo living with the garbage collectors. A lot of people make their living in Cairo the poor by sorting through garbage. She built a little shack out there. She lived with them. It was kind of the Mother Teresa of Cairo. So we went to spend this week and a half with her. It was interesting. She had a rule. because A lot of young people would come and join her to work for a while. And she had this rule. If they got angry, she sent them home. While we were there was a young woman from Winnipeg, full of, uh, you know, zeal, and she got very angry. Mother, Mother Emmanuel sent her home. She said, no, you don't do this out of anger. It's got to be done out of love. That's the first rule, and it's the major rule. Secondly, okay, a prophet is grounded in a reality beyond this world. And I'll begin with Jesus. <clears throat> And you see this, it's in the New Testament, but you see it most clearly in the Gospel of Luke. You know, in Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel is preeminently the Gospel of prayer. You know, Jesus prays in all the other Gospels, but not like in Luke. In Luke's Gospel, there's more incidents of Jesus praying than all the other Gospels put together. And Luke is the only Gospel who gets inside of Jesus' prayer. But Luke sets his Gospel up this way. The disciples are very intrigued with Jesus. And they realize that there's something very special about Jesus. And the specialness they notice is not so much that he can walk on water or that he can do miracles. That's not what they're preeminently impressed with. They're impressed with Jesus because he can actually forgive an enemy. Jesus could actually turn the other cheek. Jesus could actually love somebody who hates him, which we struggle to do. So they were, they were intrigued by this, but they realized he was drawing this power, because they were looking to him as a human being, they realized he was drawing this power from a source beyond them. They realized he was drawing this from his prayer. And that's why in Luke's gospel, it's the only gospel where the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. You know, in the other gospels, Jesus has to volunteer the lesson. He says, sit down, I'm going to teach you how to pray. In Luke's gospel, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. They're intrigued that how some he's drawing this power from some other place. But then, in the end of Luke's gospel, you have the... Oops. Sorry about that. Um, the end of Luke's gospel, you have the agony in the garden. And it shows Jesus that prayer, 
and it shows Jesus in prayer in agony. And uh, earlier on, Luke has shown Jesus praying in ecstasy in Galilee when he says, I thank you, Lord, that you've hidden these things from the learned and the clever. In the agony in the garden, Luke said, he's sweating blood. And what he's trying to do <clears throat> in the agony in the garden, he's trying to keep that link to that source, his father, so he knows he's going to be killed. He knows he's going to be betrayed by people, and he's trying to hang on to that source so he can forgive his killers, so he forgive his disciples for betraying him. And you see, it's a powerful struggle. That it's, a, it's a massive struggle, but that's what we need to prophecy. If we are trying to be prophetic for the poor in this world, our real source of energy has to come from beyond this world because we won't be able to continue to love the people we're opposing. As Daniel Berrigan says, if you can't love the people who are arresting you, don't do this. We don't have that natural power. That has to come from beyond us. Even Jesus didn't have that natural power. He had to draw it from his Father. I'll leave you with a couple of quotes here in the second one from Berrigan. He says, monks have secrets worth knowing. What he's referring to is, you know, monks pray a lot. They have secrets worth knowing that we can't draw this just from ourselves. And he said, if your prophetic stance doesn't save the world, maybe it'll save your own integrity and your own sanity. Thirdly, third commandment, a prophet draws his or her cause from Jesus and not from ideology. That's a difficult one. A prophet has to draw from Christ and not from ideology. Let me begin with a story. A story is worth a thousand words. Some years ago, I was listening to uh, or watching a, an interview with a young woman, and she's an Episcopalian priest from San Francisco. And she's doing a lot of work nationally on the whole question of climate change, the ecology, but she's doing it as a, as a priest, as a Christian. And the interviewer was, says to her, he says, you know, you come out of San Francisco, you come out of, the very, out of a very liberal context, where obviously they're hearing this. He said, but how does your message, you're traveling across the United States, how does your message go over in Oklahoma? How does it go over in, in Arkansas? What happens in Mississippi and Alabama and in West Texas? How are you received there? And she gave a very interesting answer. He said, I've learned this. He said, I've learned that the cause I'm espousing, if I speak from the gospel, says, sincere people will hear the gospel. Says, the second I fall into ideology, says, they eat me alive. Says, as long as I'm coming out of scripture, as long as I'm coming out of ecclesial principle and scriptural principle, says, sincere people will hear the gospel. Sincere people don't have to hear ideology. But this is really a struggle. Let me just be very concrete. This is one of the great struggles today with both the left and the right. Because then there's prophecy on both the left and the right. Liberals are, can be prophetic, conservatives can be prophetic. But in both cases, you know, in, in the Western world, I won't just pick on the United States, it's, we can't do it cleanly. Invariably, liberal social justice gets caught up with liberal ideology, with liberal causes. And invariably, prophecy from the right gets caught up with politics and uh, ideology of the right. And that's why we're so polarized. And that's why it's so hard for us to hear each other. Because a lot of times we're not prophesying from the gospel. We're prophesying as a Democrat or a Republican, or as a liberal or a conservative. Uh, that undercuts our prophecy right off the bat. In prophecy, there is no right or left. There is no Democrat, there is no Republican. There is no Catholic, there is no Protestant. There's only the gospel, there's only the principles of justice, and so on. And um, I think more than anything else, this is the cause, the, the reason why so much of our prophecy is ineffectual, um, along with the other reasons. Now, fourthly, a prophet is committed to nonviolence. Now, if you've ever seen the movie, and if you haven't seen it, get it and watch it. Um, the, the, the movie called Of Gods and Men. 
was done in the late 90s, and it, it's the story of these Trappist monks who were martyred by Al-Qaeda in Algeria in 1996. Okay. It's a powerful story. In fact, that's one of the great religious movies I believe it's ever made. So not even as a religious story, it's a great piece of cinematography. Just if you're just a movie as a movie, but it packs a powerful punch and it's true to life. It's so true that the director who did it, he tried to make the actors look exactly like the monks. So if you look at pictures of the actual monks, that's what the actors look like. And he took a lot of the dialogue out of the diaries of the monks themselves. But in there, there's a powerful incident. Incident. Uh, incident. They are living in this town in northern Algeria, and they're the only four. I mean, they're, 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 they're French. They're foreigners. But they're living in a very poor Islamic town. And they're kind of the heart of the town. Even though they're Christians, the other are Islamic, they have this wonderful relationship with the people, and they're actually protecting the people. And then Al-Qaeda, who were very powerful in northern Algeria in, in, the, in the early and mid-90s, begin to kill foreigners and begin to kill a lot of Muslims who aren't wearing the, 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 the headscarf and so on. And then they come to threaten the monks. So when I just, on Christmas Eve, they're getting ready for mass, they break them with machine guns, they try to terrorize the monks, and then they leave. Christian Descharge, who's up for canonization with their abbot, Afterwards, in his diary and in their prayer, everything is, he said, because we were attacked, the prayer becomes, Lord, disarm us. Simply take away all our defenses. We want to be completely disarmed as children before violence. That's nonviolence. A prophet always seeks to disarm. If we're t taking a gun, it's not prophetic. You know, you can't imagine Jesus carrying a gun. Now, a prophet seeks to incarnate God's powerlessness, God's exousia. You know, I like the next, the next line, which I'll try to explain in a minute here. Uh, Léon Blois was a famous French philosopher. In fact, he's the person, maybe the most instrumental in the conversion of Jacques and Marisa Maritain. Okay. And he says, this is a great line, he says, God defends himself only by patience and beauty. It's quite a line. God defends himself only by patience and beauty. You know, in the Gospels, which are written in Greek, there are three words for power. But in English, they're all translated as power or authority. You know, you see, you know, Jesus speaks with great power. And the scribes and Pharisees, they don't speak with power. Okay, now there's three words for power in Greek. One, and two of them we have in English. They have the word energy, energia, where you get our word energy. See, energy is a power. You know, the power of youth and physical health. The power of a middle linebacker at the peak of his career. He has great power. They have a second word which we also have, which is the word dynamic. Dynamism. See, dynamism is a power. You get a rock singer on a stage, they can have powerful um, dynamism. They can literally make the lights go out with energy. Okay. Now, it's interesting, when they talk about Jesus, they never use either of those two words. They didn't say, wow, he speaks with great energy, or he speaks with great dynamism. And they use a word which we don't have in English or Spanish. They use the word exousia. He speaks with great exousia, which we have no English translation for, but we have an English concept for. You know where we see exousia? You see exousia in a baby. You know, a baby is very powerful. Why? Because it has absolutely no power whatsoever. See, a baby just lies there completely helpless, but it's very powerful. If you put a football player, a rock star, and a baby in a room, who has the most power? <laughs> Ultimately, the baby has the most power, and that's the way God's power is always in our world. Notice the way Jesus was born. They wanted a superstar who's going to come down here and just laser the planet and clean it up morally, and they get a baby helpless in a manger. Uh, and that's the way God always acts. You know, the, that's why it can be so frustrating being a Christian and having a proper theology of God. God is always this helpless child. So as Blois says, 
God defends himself only by patience and beauty and helplessness. In the long run, that is the great power. So when we're, when we're trying to be prophetic, when we're trying to be prophetic for, for, uh, uh, for justice, we have to be careful that we disarm ourselves, that we don't come with power. Now, it's interesting. Power can be powerful politically. Incidentally, that was one of the great um, tensions between Martin Luther King and black power. Um, see, so some of the black power people said, you know, politically, we can achieve these things through some power. We'll kidnap a couple of judges and we'll wake up the white race. You know, where Martin Luther King says, no, patient, we got to change hearts. And you do it by, you know, nonviolence is precisely predicated on powerlessness. Incidentally, um, when Jesus says, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek, we normally don't get what that means. That's not a passive thing at all. First of all, he said, if, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek as well. So why the right cheek? Okay, why not the left cheek? Okay. Well, actually, it would work the other way around if the guy's left-handed, okay? But, uh, but he's referring to a ritual slap in their culture. At the time of Jesus, there was a ritual slap in the culture, and it worked this way. A master could slap a slave. A parent could slap a child. You know, a husband could slap his wife, and so on. And that had to be accepted socially. But the slap worked this way. You, they, with the back of the hand, so they'd be facing you, and they'd come up with the back of their hand, and they would hit you on the right cheek, okay? And the whole idea is you had to accept that. And the slap was meant not so much as, as, as a, you know, a physical punishment. The slap was meant as a social statement. Stay in your place. I'm your superior, and you have to receive this from me, you know? See, so Jesus said, if somebody slaps you in that way, just turn the other cheek which means they're still slapping you, but you're not accepting it as acceptable. That's what Rosa Parks did when she refused to move to the back of the bus. They could still arrest her and beat her or whatever, but she says, you can't beat me as a superior to an inferior. Muscle power can still hurt you, but it can't hurt you as superior to inferior. See, so nonviolence, as Gandhi showed, as Martin Luther King showed, as Rosa Parker showed, as, you know, um, Bishop Tutu and, and Nelson Mandela showed, it's not passive at all. Notice none of them ever brought out a gun or threatened power, but they turned the other cheek. They refused to accept violence on its own terms. Um, God defends himself only by patience and beauty. I want to make a little footnote at the bottom about a place of, of non-compromising nonviolence. What is the place of that? You know, there aren't a lot of completely nonviolent <laughs> uh, pacifists in our culture. Because even, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic, our official teaching is that you can use self-defense, that there can, is such a thing as a just war. That's the Roman Catholic teaching. The Roman Catholic teaches that there is such a thing as a just war. And, um, and some very liberal theologians will tell you that. I remember being shocked in the classroom when Edward Skillebeck says, someone said, is there such a thing as a just war? He said, absolutely. He said, and at times it's a necessity. He said, you know, we're going, to be, we're going to be judged by what we didn't do, that we didn't intervene in Rwanda when a million people were, were, were genocided and so on. He said, sometimes you have to. He said, imagine you're, you're walking on the street and three people are beating up an elderly woman, said, may you intervene? You have to intervene. Okay, that's Catholic teaching. Now, but well, we've always had pure fast pacifists. Dorothy Day, you know, Gandhi, Daniel Berrigan, so on. These are people who say, John Deere, they'll say, never, never, never. You may just never do an act of violence in God's name. Pure pacifism. Well, people will point out, they say, that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. You can't have a country without soldiers. You can't have a country without guns, without policemen. Imagine if California, they did away with all the police force. Well, you'd have chaos, you know, and policemen need to carry guns, except if they're in England. 
Okay. Now, what's the place of pacifism? One of the better answers I ever got was from Cardinal George of Chicago. And somebody wanted to ask Cardinal George, says, what is the place of pure pacifists? The Dorothy Days, the Daniel Berrigans, the Gandhis, and so on, who said, you may never, never use violence. They always said, because all violence begets further violence. All guns produce further guns, and so on. Now, George gave an interesting answer. Cardinal George says, pacifists are to our society what celibates are to our church. They point to the next world. You know, celibacy has no meaning in this world whatsoever. It points to the next world. What pacifists point to, they say, in heaven there'll be no guns. It's simply saying that, and they're right. In heaven there will be no guns. A pacifist is already pointing to that, and so on. Now, in this world, Sadly, sometimes we need guns. But a prophet is committed to nonviolence. Now, fifth, a prophet articulates God's voice for the poor on this earth. A prophet articulates God's voice. Okay. And I can put this into, into a, a challenging one line, which is the first line. Any gospel that isn't speaking for the poor any prophet who's not speaking for the poor is not a prophet of Jesus. Remember Jesus' very first line, I've come to bring good news to the poor. The, the word gospel means good news. It doesn't necessarily mean good advice. We sometimes think gospel means good. The gospel means it's announcing good news, and the good news is for the poor. So I've come to bring good news to the poor. And any gospel that doesn't do that is not the gospel of Christ. Any prophet who isn't speaking for the poor is not a prophet of Jesus. Now, who are the poor? That seems like a silly question, but it's not. You know, um, in fact, some friends of mine in, in, in poorer countries, they say, you know, only in the Western world, in the affluent world, can you ask that question, who are the poor? So if you ask the poor, they know immediately. Okay, we have to have conferences on that. But actually, the conferences are worthwhile. Who are the poor? Biblically, uh, they put it into, a, into code. Biblically, there's a code for the poor that are called widows, orphans, and strangers. The poor are the widows, the orphans, and the strangers. Okay? Now, because that's code that means the three most vulnerable groups in society at any given time. And that can change. Vasco today, in the United States, in California, Texas, where I live, and so on, who are the three most vulnerable groups? Or I can put it into another line, the excluded one. You know, um, if you ask people like Gutierrez, you say, who are the poor? He said, the poor is always the excluded one. You know, when, when Jesus, when they're contemplating his crucifixion, and Caiaphas, the high priest, says, he says this, it's better that one man should die for the people. You know, he's, making a, he's actually making a political judgment there. They don't want the Romans to come down on them and shut down their festivals and kill some people. Much better, one person dies. It's going to save a lot of heartache here and so on. You know? But society, we're always saying that about certain groups. It's better that these people should die or should be put away, excluded, than to interfere with their way of life. So if we ask today, and if I risk some applications here, who are the excluded ones? Well, that's why... Abortion is such an important social justice thing. The unborn can be sacrificed today for other reasons. Immigrants, you know, they interfere, they change life, so on. Who are the orphans? Is it the aged? Is it the, the psychologically disadvantaged? And so on. But it's always what groups, about what group is our society saying, we can live without you? If you're around, it, it interferes with our life. Okay. Those are the poor. And prophecy is always about that group. Christ makes a preferential option for the poor. I'll give you one line just for flavor from Berrigan where he says, uh, we've added a quality to the church that the crucified Christ never envisaged, the church compatible. Now, sixthly, and that's, that's a mistake on the number there. It's, it's supposed to be six. A prophet doesn't foretell the future. 
but properly aims the presence and function of the future. You know, we have this silly thing, very popular, that somehow prophets foretell the future. Prophets don't foretell the future. Prophets properly name the present. And oftentimes they do name it as a lament. So the great prophets of Israel, they named the present religious situation, and they would name it oftentimes negatively as a lament, but a prophet doesn't foretell the future. I'll give you some quotes here. Richard Rohr is fond of saying, not everything can be fixed or cured, but it should be named properly. It's a good line. James Hillman, great philosopher, says, a symptom suffers most when it doesn't know where it belongs. I like that line. Have you ever had this happen? You have some pain in your back, wherever, and, uh, or a headache that doesn't go away, and you start thinking dark thoughts, my God, is this cancer, is it this, whatever. You see a doctor, the doctor says, that is arthritis. Not a pleasant diagnosis, but you know what it is. Okay. The symptom has been named, but prophets name the symptoms. Today, we need prophets in this country, we need prophets all over the world to properly name what's happening, you know, to properly, just prophesying freelance from a stage, you know, as an academic. Today, in the entire world, the gap between rich and poor is growing, and it's growing exponentially. That's wrong. It doesn't matter who the, who, who the politicians are, but that is simply wrong. That's anti-gospel, it's anti-Jesus, it's anti-Christ, it's anti-our faith. You know, we have to keep saying that, you know. Uh, we don't predict the future. We say, this is wrong. This shouldn't be, okay. John of the Cross says, the language of God is the experience that God writes into our lives. Or, you know, learn to read the signs of the times. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting, I've asked you this. It's an interesting, do, do this sometime in your Bible groups and so on, is to take, to seek for biblical images that name the present moment. So it's like, what, what is the present moment? A priest from the mind said he once had a group together in a parish, and he says, what is our present moment? And some woman said, Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, she may not be right, but she speaks an entire volume in that one sentence. Since so they say, well, we're in a postmodern world of relativity of this and that, and so it's Sodom and Gomorrah. But you know, a lot of uh, people that I read who I think are prophetic, and they'll use images like, they'll say, we're, we're in the belly of the whale, or we're in the desert, we're in the exile. I remember once in class in Belgium, somebody asked Edward Skilibex just that question. <clears throat> they said, Professor Skilibex, if you had to name one biblical image where we're at today, he didn't hesitate, he said, we're on the road to Emmaus. We're on the road to me. I said, we're, we're walking away from experience of faith that we had as kids, which was crucified. We're depressed. Christ is walking with us, but we haven't recognized the Christ that's walking with us. See, that's, that's prophecy. Prophecy names the present, and you'll never name it deeper than if you use biblical images. Okay. Then, seventh. A prophet speaks out of the horizon of hope. It's interesting, if you're trying to be prophetic, and you're watching the news every night, unless you are completely asleep, you're not going to be able to do it. You won't be able to do it out of wishful thinking or optimism. See, we often confuse hope with two things that it's not. Hope isn't wishful thinking, and hope isn't optimism. So what's wrong with this statement? Someone says, I hope I could win a lottery. No, you can't hope to win. You can wish to win a lottery. See, because wishing isn't based on anything. Just, well, I wish that I could win a lottery. Hope is based on something. And the same hope is natural optimism, where someone says, you know, I'm an upbeat person, and I always see the glasses half full. I'm always upbeat about things. That's a wonderful temperament. It's not hope. You can be full of optimism and have no hope. You can be pessimistic and be full of hope. What is hope? Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a story from Teilhard de Chardin. It's my all-time favorite story of hope. Teilhard was a great figure. He's a great scientist. He was, was a, a, a mystic, philosopher, and a visionary. And he was giving a talk one day in which he was, 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 was a very hope-filled talk. 
from a Christian point of view, how Jesus comes and he incorporates the eschatological age and how that ties into where science is going and the Big Bang and all this. And when he was finished, the man said to him, said, well, that's a very optimistic view of things. He said, suppose we blow up the world with an atomic bomb. Then what happens? Teilhard said, well, that would be a two million year setback. Okay. <laughs> okay. Notice that, that, that would just be a two million year setback. It would be an act an act of colossal stupidity, and so on. He said, what I say is going to happen, he said, not because I'm wishing it, not that I'm optimistic it's going to happen, he said, it's going to happen, why? He said, because Christ promised it. And in the resurrection, God shows that God has power to deliver on that promise. It's the best definition of hope you're going to hear. Hope is based on the promise of Christ, and God's backing up of that promise. What is the promise of Christ? Well, I'll put it into very simple language. The great line from Julian of Norwich. Julian of Norwich, the great mystic, she's famous for this line for many other things too. But remember her line, she says, in the end, all will be well and all will be well and every manner of being will be well. To which Oscar Wilde added a nice little line, he says, and if it isn't well, it's still not the end. You know, none of you ever woke up dead yet, and you won't. Okay. So Julian of says, the end of our story is written. The end of this planet is written. It's written, and it's going to, all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of being will be well. Jesus preached that, and they killed him. But God raised his dead body from the dead. That is the foundation of Christianity. Remember, Paul says, if you don't believe that, and if that never happened, we're the most deluded of all people. See, our hope is based on something concrete. Christ promised this. God delivered and shows that God delivers on the promise. So we can live our lives, no matter what's happening, no matter what situation we're in, no matter how terrible it is, no matter if we're dying of cancer, no matter what's happening, the end of our story is written, and it's a happy ending. Then we can live in the face of that, we can preach hope even when things seem hopeless. Otherwise, we can't do it. You know, they tell wonderful stories about uh, Bishop Tutu, uh, the Episcopalian Anglican bishop of Cape Town, and who was one of the major figures in bringing down apartheid. And they say at the, at the peak of the struggle against apartheid, he'd be preaching in the cathedral on a Sunday morning. He said, just as he began his homily, the soldiers would come in and line both sides of the aisles with machine guns. And Tutu would smile at them and say, well, I'm glad you came to church. He said, I'm sure your mothers are happy about that. <laughs> but then he'd say this. He said, I'm glad you came to join the winning side. He said, We've already won. He wasn't talking about apartheid. He was talking about, in the end, all will be well. He was talking about the resurrection of Christ. You know, as Christians, we sometimes forget this. We don't have to save the world. None of us have to save the world. The world is already saved. That's our Easter. That's what we're going to celebrate in five weeks. The world is already saved. We only have to live in face of the fact that we believe it. And when we do it, we can live in hope. And we can become prophets of hope. I want to quote the last name on there. Pierre Olivier Trombley, not just because he's an oblate from my community, but um, one of his insights. He spoke at our school some years ago, and it was a, it was a, the theme wasn't hope. The theme was actually on youth. How can we reach out to youth? Why aren't youth coming to church and so on? And at the time, he was the chaplain, a chaplain at the University of Laval in Quebec, Canada. And he gave a very strong talk, and he began this way. He said, you know, I work as a chaplain among young people at Laval University. And he says, these are young kids, 19, 20, 21, he says, and they're so full of life, and they're so full of their dreams, and they're so full of energy, they're so full of color, he said, but they don't have any hope. He said, none of them has hope. He said, they don't have hope, he said, because they don't have a meta-narrative. He said, they don't have a big story. He said, of all this energy in life, but." Their hearts go up and down, depending what's happening on a given day. 
they broke up with their boyfriend, they're suicidally depressed. Come back, and they're up, and so on. He says, they're, they're not, their story isn't part of a big story. You know, I grew up a Roman Catholic in the 50s. You know, we had our own problems. <laughs> but we had a meta-narrative, which they taught us in the Baltimore Catechism and in church. You know, who made you? God. Why did God make you? To know, love, and serve him in this life and be happy with him in the next. And they told us the Adam and Eve story and Jesus coming and so on. We were part of a big narrative, you know. And every day we'd say the Salve Regina, for now we mourn, weeping in this valley of tears, but then we're going to be happy. See, we had a big story. And the story has a happy ending. In the end, all will be well and all will be well. And every manner of being will be well. Hans Urs von Balthasar, the great theologian, said this. He says, imagine you're acting in a play. It's a five-act play, and you're the hero or the heroine. Okay? And, you know, in, in, uh, in great drama, the hero or the heroine has to undergo a lot of trial. But, you know, at the end, you get to marry the prince, wear the glass slipper, you're, the, you're, you're, you're exalted. He said, well, you can endure. You can endure a lot of pain and suffering in Acts 2 and 3 and 4 because you know the ending. That's true for us as Christians. Our ending's already written, and it's a happy ending. In the end, it'll all be well. And that gives us the vision. It gives us the energy to, to, to work with what isn't, what isn't well. You know, it gives us a vision beyond optimism and beyond wishful thinking. Now, number eight. A prophet's heart and cause are never a ghetto. To begin with a quote, I've always loved the quote from Nikos Kassanzakis, the man who wrote Zorba the Greek. And he says, the bosom of God is never a ghetto, but the heart of man often is. It's a wonderful line. The bosom of God is never a ghetto, but the heart of man often is. And that reflects Jesus just as another way of saying this. Remember, Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. He's not talking about architecture in the sky. He's talking about the scope of God's heart, the universality of God's heart. Now, prophecy always has to reflect the universality of God's heart, that God has no favorites, that God isn't narrow, that God isn't some tribal deity, that God isn't our God that somehow we're special in God's eyes. So we are, but so is everybody else. You know? God has no favorites. You know? All people are favored by God. And um, bad prophecy is always signified that it's narrow. It's about one thing. It's about one cause. It's about, no. Um, God's heart is not a ghetto. In my father's house, there are many rooms. Let me risk saying something about that. <clears throat> You know, Jesus says, um, the Father lets his, he said, be compassionate the way God is compassionate. He said, and God lets his compassion, his Son, shine on the bad as well as the good. That's quite a statement. And he asks us to be like that. He said, God, when the sun shines today, it's going to shine on vegetables and weeds in exactly the same way. See, the sun isn't discriminatory. The sun doesn't say vegetables are good, they get light, weeds are bad, we starve them out. The sun just shines. Jesus said God's heart is like the sun, and it shines, and he says um, on everybody. So, this is the risk. You know, God loves pro-life people, and God loves pro-choice people equally. God loves Democrats and God loves Republicans equally. God loves Trump supporters and anti-Trump supporters equally. God loves Catholics and Protestants equally. And God loves Christians and Muslims and Jews and, and uh, Buddhists equally. And at a certain point, our hearts have to be that wide. You know, Socrates once said this, and I love it. Socrates says, when you define your nationality, don't start from the narrow to the wide. Socrates said, I'm a citizen of the world first, then I'm a citizen of Athens. You know, first of all, we're citizens of this world. 
afterwards were citizens of Athens. And even in our, our faith, First of all, you are a universal child of God, and secondly, you're a Christian, and so on. That because with that universality, you identify with everybody. Um, that's the importance of, of just universal thinking, and as Cardinal Bernadine called that in, in all of our prophetic, prophetic causes, the seamless garment. That also means, for instance, pro-life means all the causes. Ecology means all the causes. And again, just to concretize that, both the right and the left struggle immensely with this. We always make God our own particular tribal God. And that these causes are important and the others aren't. You know? And so that, uh, in, for instance, in left ideology, you know, so many wonderful things, but abortion doesn't fit in. In right ideology, so many wonderful things, but there's issues of climate change and immigration and stuff that don't fit in. Um, the bosom of God is not a ghetto. Okay, nine. A prophet doesn't speak, just speak or write. A prophet acts. And acts with courage, even at the cost of death. You know, it's interesting uh, the first line I said, a prophet is a magus who can also act. Okay, what is a magus? Remember in, in, in scripture we have the famous magi who come to the crib. Okay, we always call them the three kings. But actually scripture says they're, they're magi, which is plural for magus. But a magus is a wisdom figure, you know. And if you're a woman, magus, you're a sophia. You know, a woman, a sophia, that's a magus. If you're a man, you're a magus. Okay, these are people who, they're wise. But you know what the congenital flaw is with maguses? I am one, I live with one, is that we can write about it, we can speak about it, but we can't act. <laughs> okay. Robert Moore used to say, when the last tree in America has been cut down, there's going to have been a lot of academic studies written about why that is bad. <laughs> okay, you get the point. We, we, can, we can write about it, we can talk about it, but we can't do it. Okay, now, the task of a prophet is not just to write and speak, the task of a prophet is to act. You know, a wonderful example of this is Archbishop Romero was just canonized. You know, if you ever see Romero's story, and you can see that Paulus did a wonderful film on him and so on, but you'll see in there the evolution of a magus to a prophet. And it's this. Romero was named bishop. Why? Because he was an academic who was this wonderfully nice guy. And everybody thought, well, he's not going to make any waves at all. He's this wonderful, studious, wise man. He's not going to ruffle anybody's feathers. He's never insulted anybody in his whole life. But you see after he's made archbishop and he begins to see the injustice, and you just see this clear revolution where the magus becomes the warrior, where the intellectual becomes the prophet, to a point where you can go and tell the president, you're lying and I'm calling you on it. And you can shoot me and it doesn't matter. See, that's, that's a prophet speaking. And you see that he was literally baptized by the poor to become this great prophet who dies as a martyr. We struggle with that. Uh, and, and it's hard. And, and it's, it's hard precisely because you are a nice person. You know, one of, the, one of the biggest obstacles for us to do prophecy is because we're nice people. We don't want to upset anybody. You don't want to get anybody's faces. You know, you, you want to understand all the stuff and you want to have this wide heart and so on. And that's wonderful. It's a quality. And yet at a certain point, it can paralyze us. Where, you know, I'm such a nice person that I simply can't uh, be a prophet. Um, that's the way Romero was. But eventually, just the needs of the poor pushed him to become prophetic. You know, I mentioned before the name Larry Rosebow. Larry Rosebow was an oblate who was shot to death in Guatemala in 2010. And Larry had worked with the Berrigans here in the United States, was in prison a number of times in the United States. And then when he was released, he went to Brazil, where he lived on the street, just with the street people, as a priest, for about six or seven years. And no rectory would eat whatever they could find on the street and so on. It was kind of a chaplain for the poor in the streets 
in Brazil. Then he got hepatitis, and he almost died, so we flew him back. He spent a couple of years recovering in our mother house and our novitiate and so on, during which time he wrote a wonderful book on his life and so on. Um, eventually, we turned to Guatemala and was shot to death there and so on. Um, but Larry said, you know what the hardest thing for me was? He said, it wasn't even prison. It was the fact, he said, that so many people close to me could not understand this. He said, they wanted me to be a nice monsignor <laughs> with French cuffs who had baptized babies. He said, and I wish I could do that too. He said, but, you know, he said, I just saw the poor and I couldn't. Incidentally, he, he was a prophet. He was in prison in three different countries and eventually shot to death for what he stood for. He was the gentlest man I've ever met. You couldn't have got a violent bone in Larry. Uh, you could have searched with, with a GPS. He wouldn't have found one. Um, okay. And there at the bottom, a prophet never seeks martyrdom, but accepts it if it finds him. Again, in that marvelous movie, um, of gods and men. They make a decision to stay there knowing they're going to be killed. And it's a huge struggle. And the abbot, who's a saint, keeps telling him, he said, up to the last minute we want to escape. Nobody volunteers for martyrdom. Jesus didn't volunteer for martyrdom. They came and arrested him. You know? So you never seek it, but if it finds you, you accept it. Then finally, the last one, <clears throat> A prophet can discern at which times to park the placard and bring out the basin and the towel. And that's a line from Raymond E. Brown. First of all, Raymond E. Brown, um, this incident, there's just been a marvelous biography published by him, on him by Donald Sr. So there's a marvelous biography on Raymond Brown, who's one of, I think, one of the great scripture scholars of our time, but also a marvelous priest and a wonderful figure. I was very blessed to have had a course from him once. And he'd always tell us, he said, you know, um, we need to be prophetic. And we need to be out there speaking <clears throat> for the poor. We need to do the Romero things. But we also need to know at which time you put your placard into the closet and you pull out the basin and towel and begin to wash other people's feet. So let me end on this. You know, when you read the Gospel of John, which is a curious gospel altogether. You know, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they write up Jesus from the point of his, of his view of his humanity, and they have a kind of a certain chronology of Jesus' life. John hasn't got any of this. John's gospel is written much later, and in John's gospel, there's no humanity to Jesus. He's God from the first line. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So in John's gospel, Jesus is God walking in human flesh, okay? And then he has a very curious take on the Eucharist in the Last Supper. You know, in the other gospels and in St. Paul, the Eucharist is instituted at the Last Supper, okay? In John's gospel, there is no bread and wine mentioned at the Last Supper, okay? And in the other gospels, the Last Supper is one paragraph. In John's gospel, it's over half of the entire gospel is a, is a speech, Jesus makes at the Last Supper, you know. But in John's Gospel, the Eucharist is attached not to the Last Supper explicitly. It's attached to the feeding of the manna. And incidentally, Roman Catholics in this room, that's where the Roman Catholics get our theology of daily Eucharist from John's Gospel. John's community probably had Eucharist every day. The others probably didn't. Because John ties it to the manna. It's God's daily feeding of his people. Okay, but then when he gets to the Last Supper, he doesn't mention bread and wine. And when the others bring out bread and wine, he brings out the basin and towel, which is for John, he's explaining the meaning of the Eucharist, you know, and what is the meaning of the Eucharist? Well, John's gospel is written somewhere between 95 and 100. So Jesus has been dead for 70 years, and John would have seen a lot of church life in 70 years, and church life then was like church life now. now. They fought about everything. <laughs> okay. And they had different theologies of the Eucharist, of who could preside, and so on. They had all of our problems. So when John gets to the Eucharist, he says, this is what the Eucharist means. Jesus got up, took a basin and towel, and began to wash his disciples' feet. Now, what's the meaning of that gesture? Okay. Well, there's, in John's gospel, everything has about three levels of meaning. And we get the first level. 
The first level is this is a wonderful act of humility. See, the master washes the servant's feet. Beautiful poem by John Shea. He says, at the Last Supper, Jesus got up and he turned the mantle of privilege into the apron of service. It's a wonderful expression. The mantle of privilege becomes the apron of service. It's humility, but it's not just any act of humility. He was reaching across the major social customs of the time. And that's why he also got resistance, you know. What were the customs? Let me rephrase this. You know, today, let's take maybe the most singular divisive issue in our culture, which is the issue of abortion. You know what John would do if he came back today? He'd say, let's stop arguing. Let's bring out a basin and towel, and let's have pro-life wash pro-choice's feet, and pro-choice wash pro-life's feet. Then we'll have Donald Trump wash Hillary's feet, and Hillary wash his feet. <laughs> we'll have some Democrats wash Republican feet, and Republican wash Democrats' feet. He said, He says, then there'll maybe be some chance for us to have communion. We can have Eucharist. You know, so Raymond Brown says, we need to be prophetic, but we also, and it ties to, you make a vow of love, we need to be prophetic, but we also need to know exactly, now it's time to put the placard away. Now it's time to bring out a basin and towel and to reach across the aisle with a different kind of humility. So those are the, I will leave you with some, some quotes to... Uh, to look at and so on, um, because of the, the setup in here, we're not, we won't have questions. period. I'll be here if you want to ask me some questions and so on. Um, but just look at, and as we're talking and leaving, you can look at, at these quotes. Um, <clears throat> Let me particularly look at the second last one. And these all come from Daniel Berrigan. It says, the payment for birth is blood. The cost of rebirth cannot be cheap. Um, the best way to do, be hopeful is to do hopeful things and so on. So anyway, thank you for your attention this morning and uh, happy prophetic times ahead. Thank you, Father, for your words of wisdom. Just a reminder that the workshop evaluations for Religious Education Congress are done electronically. So you have two options. One is to use your smart device and the Congress app and to evaluate the workshops. You can do that right after the workshop is completed. Your other option is when you return home to go to the Congress website recongress.org and look for the link to the evaluation and you can evaluate all the workshops one right after another uh, from the website when you return home. We appreciate your evaluation and your input. The Congress committee takes that seriously and reads every one and so we thank you in advance uh, for your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>